Uh, first of all, thank you so much for uh, choosing this session. I understand that this is an unconference, which uh, allows you to move in and out of rooms. Um, so I'm so, uh, very happy that you're here. I'm happy that you stayed here till the end. <laughs> allowed to leave, of course. Um, my name is Peter Hartman. I'm a motivational speaker. I'm also a comedian, among other things. Uh, so um, I'm going to give you my spiel here today. But look, I'm not in a comedy club right here. Okay, so I don't have this inherent permission to joke around. So I have to ask you: If I see an opportunity for a joke, should I take it? Yeah. Yes. All right. You said yes. Just remember that. <laughs> All right. Okay, folks. Uh, does anybody have any idea what to expect with what's happening next? Okay, good, neither. I've got no clue. I've yeah. the test. Anybody raise their hand, they're a villain. Okay. <laughs> uh, so we're going to have a fun time here today. Uh, my message is pretty simple, uh, but I think it's bold, and I think it's something that uh, will improve uh, whatever you're doing and improve your life. Uh, most importantly, I think it's going to improve the world. All right, so let's get started. <coughs> I don't know what the other sessions were like, but um, I like to engage, uh, I like to be a little bit more interactive. So if at any, any point you want to speak up, say something, you raise your hand, anything like that, please feel free to do so. Uh, you're not going to throw me off, it's going to be fine. Who here is an entrepreneur? Excellent. Who here wants to be an entrepreneur? Excellent. Okay. So from an entrepreneur to folks who are not entrepreneurs yet, let me tell you, it ain't easy. All right? Some of you are thinking, you know what? I hate my job, I don't like the way things are going. I'm going to go do something easier. I'm going to be my own boss. <laughs> okay, all the entrepreneurs know exactly what I'm talking about. It's way harder to do your own thing, right? It's far harder to do your own thing. What are the, what are the troubles, what are the stresses, what are the, what are the difficulties that you might have experienced as an entrepreneur? Is anybody willing to share just... Lack of self-discipline. Lack of self-discipline. Very good. Taxes. Yeah. Taxes, absolutely. Just don't pay him. Just don't pay him. Back of funds. Back of funds, absolutely. Perfect. Time management. Time management. Getting new business. Getting new business, absolutely. Uh, if anything goes wrong, it's all on me. It's all on me. I'm the one to blame. Can't quit. Can't quit. Oh my goodness, that's right. You just remind me I can't quit. That's right. That's, that's a good truth. Yeah. Excellent. Difficulties, right? It's difficult. Did you see how easy it was for us to talk about the difficulties of being an entrepreneur? But what the heck do we stick with it? Why do we keep at it? I remember I worked 9 to 5. And I worked in my little cubicle 9 to 5. And I felt like I was doing monkey work, you know? And they'd ask me, I remember one day, and I know it's monkey work, because I know one day uh, my boss comes up to me, to everybody, and says, hey, we're going to do something new today. Uh, we, we, uh, the head office has asked us to file these reports. You want to do these, these new reports and file them. And I'm sitting there thinking, what are these reports and who are getting them? I had the sneaking suspicion that they were just giving us more work to do. So I decided not to do my reports. Mm -hmm. And I just going to see what happened. I'm the type of person, I'll jump off the cliff. We'll see if any harm comes my way. Then I'll force you. <laughs> Everybody's filling out the reports, banging their heads against people, filling out the reports. It's so annoying filling out these reports. Week after week, nobody's come to Peter for one report, not one day. And I realized there's a lot that goes on in the jobs that people are dealing with that it really it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter. You can get away with uh, not being your best. You can get away with, uh, do, with some jobs. You can get away with doing half of what you want to do. Look, if you're a doctor, do it all. If you're a doctor, please do it all. But, uh, but it, it, I don't know about you, I don't know if you've met people there at their jobs who are feeling unfulfilled, they're feeling like what they're doing doesn't really matter. And I know that's one of the reasons I became an entrepreneur. When I started, when I gave my two weeks notice at my job, look, I hated my job so much. But when I gave my two weeks notice, suddenly I was happy. I was doing the same work and the same job and I felt happy. And then I realized, oh, it wasn't really the job that was getting me down. It was just the sense that I lacked control over my life. I lacked autonomy. I lacked being self-directed. Does that resonate with you? Part of what we want as an entrepreneur is to direct yourself. Now here's the thing. I don't know what kind of world you think you live in, but the world I think we live in is a world where we're being manipulated by the powers that be. Consciously, unconsciously, deliberately, unintentionally, there's this sort of 
game that's going on, and in entrepreneurship, I find that game is still there. I think as an entrepreneur, you can very, very easily fall into the pattern, the same type of pattern that you did in your job. Except the boss that you're catering to is not necessarily you or not, not necessarily some person, some man or woman. It's a concept, it's this idea of being an entrepreneur. So we tend to sometimes copy other entrepreneurs, right? We follow what other people have done before us, which makes sense, right? It makes sense that we would follow what happened, what, what the people did before us. But then sometimes we can get sort of locked into those steps. I'm very appreciative of the entrepreneurs that come before us. Entrepreneurs that come before us show us a way of being, show us a way of interacting with the world that's very useful. I grew up in uh, Montreal, in Montreal, and I lived in, a, lived in a neighborhood called St. Henry, and I, I would travel to go to school. I traveled from point A to point B to go to school. I had to travel from my house, and I had to go to the subway, to the metro, to the subway. In Montreal, it's called the metro. And I, I'm a terribly impatient person. I like to get to places as fast as possible. So I know the shortest distance between two points is what? It's a straight line. So I map out a straight line from my house to the subway, except there's all kinds of things in my way, all kinds of obstacles in my way. There wasn't a clean road, there wasn't a clean path. I followed down an alley and then I got to a fence, a fence that bordered a giant field where a train ran through. And then the other side was my destination, was the subway. So I get to the fence and uh, I notice that someone has cut open the fence <laughs> right where I need to go. Turns out there's other people who like straight rides too. <laughs> but, well, am I the type of person to damage property and cut open the fence? Sort of, but I didn't, I wouldn't have done it back then. Not when I was 12 years old, not when I was 15 years old. But I was very glad that some other crazy person did this. I was very glad that someone else decided, hey, I want to get here, I'm going to cut open the fence, I'm going to walk through. Now what's funny about this is that this happened all year long, not only in the summer, but in the winter time. I get to the, to the field in the winter time, the fence would be cut open. I mean, folks would come and mend the fence, and some person would come back and cut it right open. And I was like, there's a war going on, and I'm the beneficiary of this war. I go through, but then in the winter time, the whole field would be full of snow, just filled up with snow. They're not cleaning it like the road, it's filled with snow. And still, it would be cut open, and then I'd see footsteps in the snow. And those footsteps made it easier for me to walk in that path. And that's what entrepreneurs do for us, the ones who come before us. They sort of mark the way forward and make it easier for us to follow suit, right? We're standing on the shoulders of giants, right? They make it easier for us. They made it easier for us and we'll make it easier for the people who come after us. But sometimes, I'd be walking in the steps. And it wasn't only in this field, maybe you've had this experience, you're walking on a path somewhere, and you realize, well, I, I kind of want to go off the path. I want to kind of do my own thing. I want to go between those trees. I want to go follow along that path. And then, but the snow's high, and it's hard now to come off the path. At first, when I got to the fence, I was in the mode of going off the beaten trail, but then I got used to walking in the footsteps of the people who came before me. You can fall into grooves, you can fall into routines, you can fall into a pattern of behavior of habit. And as an entrepreneur, the same spark that causes you to be different, to leave the trail, to be different, to move out from what other people have done, to be different, to leave that job, to leave the safety, to leave what was there before, it's the same spirit you want to cultivate even as you do your entrepreneurship, even as you're walking those paths. So I'm walking those footsteps and I'm still questioning Every time I take a step, is this the step that I want to take? Does that make sense? All right. I'm going to talk about the principles that are required. The principles that are required for ethical entrepreneurship. What do I mean by ethical entrepreneurship? What is ethics? Does anybody know what ethics is? When you think of the word ethics, what does that mean to you? Sounds like a big word. Ethics. Any decision <coughs> Harder for me to sleep at night. <laughs> <laughs> Any decision that makes it harder for me to sleep at night. Absolutely. Ethics requires a sort of conscious attention, a type of morality about how to behave. Ethics is how we treat each other, how we treat people, how we treat each other. Now, entrepreneurs, they're serving a role in our society. Entrepreneurs, look, 
I don't know what we think about Christopher Columbus, but in order to do what he did, sail across the ocean, you gotta be a little crazy, right? You gotta be a little bit nuts. There's gotta be a little weird, right? My mother didn't raise anybody to sail across the ocean, I'll tell you that, okay? And if I'm not gonna do that, I'm gonna be a little bit, I'm gonna have to deviate away from the norm, right? Entrepreneurs serve a role in that they highlight different ways of being, uh, autonomous ways of, of expressing yourself and of solving problems. They, they're doing their own thing. But as they're doing their own thing, and they're expressing themselves and expressing their value, they're influencing the world around them. Look, there are a lot of entrepreneurs on this planet, but are all entrepreneurs ethical? Are all <coughs> entrepreneurs doing right by the world? Look, I don't know. I get in trouble for saying this, so I'm going to try and hesitate, but I don't know if McDonald's makes the best burger, all right? McDonald's doesn't make the best burger, all right? You know, and I wonder sometimes, how ethical is it, not only McDonald's, but all the fast food that we have, how ethical is it some of the shows that we watch, how ethical is it some of the podcasts that are online, like, are they really serving the public, or are they serving the bottom line, are they trying to get profit, are they trying to make that club? Now, Am I a person here that says, making money is wrong? No, oh, no, and if you have money, please give it to me. I would love some of it, okay? Making money is not wrong. But the reasons why we make money matter. Because if we don't care about the reasons why we make money, we might fall into traps, fall into behaviors, and follow footsteps that lead us on a, in a path, in a way that doesn't serve our interests. And most importantly, it doesn't serve humanity. I believe that entrepreneurs are serving a role for the human species. They are a part of the superorganism of humanity that are willing to deviate, to go outside of the norm, to find different ways for human beings to behave so that the other human beings can follow along behind them. I think you serve a role in this world. And I think I want you, I care so much about, I care so much about the way the future is going to look. And I want to encourage every single one of you crazy people to care more so than ever before about what you're doing and why you're doing it. So I want to talk about three principles here that will help with that. The three principles, I, I'm borrowing the three words that you know for sure, as a fact, okay? There's who, there is why, and how. I'm going to define those terms here for you. So the why. Uh, uh, forgive me, the who, the who. The who is you, the who is the self. The who is the self, okay? As an entrepreneur, you are taking charge of yourself. But I want to expand the definition of self before I say that. Who here believes that being selfish is wrong? Who here believes that being selfish is wrong? Or maybe being selfish isn't maybe the best thing. Maybe wrong is too strong to go. Maybe isn't the best thing. Who here would prefer someone to be selfless over selfish? Okay, good. Right? So we do have this bias towards being selfless over selfish. Because on some level we go, yeah, selfless is important, but we also want to care about the other. Now, I believe that every individual should be selfish, incredibly selfish. I think you should care 100% about what's going on in your life, about what matters to you. Why? The cell that's in your arm here, is not concerned about the cell that's in your shoulder. The cell that's in your arm is doing all that it can to be the best cell that it can be. And by being the best version of itself, it helps the whole. Thing. You with me? By being the best version of who you are, you actually make the world a better place. Now sometimes we act selflessly, and it sounds good, it sounds wonderful. I grew up as a fundamentalist Christian, selfless, selfless, be humble. But when you act not in according to your own best interest, but because someone told you to do this, or because you were trained to do this, not because you understand what's going on, just because you feel that you, it's, it's better to deny yourself and to cater to other people, you can, you can kind of fall into a trap. You can kind of be manipulated. But when you recognize what selfishness really is, true selfishness, what it really is, is caring about yourself to such a degree that you benefit the people around you, then you're going to be willing to ask yourself, what matters to me the most? Now, does that mean I want you to not care about people at all? No, absolutely not. What I want you to do is to expand the definition of self to include other people. 
It's like wearing your oxygen mask before you put that on your school mask. Okay. Absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. Absolutely right. Yeah. I remember the first time I heard them say that presentation on the plane, put it on you before your kids, I was like, this person doesn't have kids, what are you talking about? How do you deny, how do you suppress the urge to help your kid? But it's important. Yeah. Because if your kid's got the mask on, he's breathing fine, and you're kind of tossed out there, kid's going to still be in kind of a little bit of trouble, right? But if you can get your mask on first, then you're helping them. Yes. Now, a mother, when a mother, let's say a mother doesn't have enough food for her and her child, and she gives the food instead of her to her child, would you say she's being selfless or selfish? Is that mother being selfless or selfish? Selfless. Selfless. Because she's expanded the definition of herself to include her child. Helping her child is helping herself. Now the reason why this is important is because when someone wants you to help other people, just help other people, and you're not connected to that idea, it's difficult to act in that way. It's difficult to help other people. But when you recognize that helping someone else is actually helping you, now you have the motivation in order to do the right thing, to behave in a way, to even do, to, to, to expend more energy, more effort in order to help someone else. Are you with me so far? We're expanding the, the definition of self. Entrepreneurs are selfish creatures. They care about what they're doing. But what I want you to do is not just care about what you're doing. I know you think, I just have a podcast. I just have a podcast. I'm just trying to make this a simple podcast. How does this help the world? How does this connect to everyone else? Do you think that there's anything you can do, anything at all? Is there any action that you can take, big or small, that does not influence the world around you? Is there any action that you can take? Do you know that when you smile at, stranger, uh, smile at someone on the street and someone else sees you, they are statistically more likely to smile at someone else that day? Everyone who sees you. If somebody drops their things on the ground and you help them up, everyone who sees that is statistically more likely to help someone else that day. Because what you pay attention to influences your being. And when you act in accordance with your value and other people see that value, it influences them as well. Every action that you take causes a ripple effect that shapes the world. And now with the internet, with technology, we're so much more connected now than ever before. The smallest action that you take, every tweet that you send, every post that you share, every Facebook like, every video that you view, shapes the world. Do you feel like you're shaping, that you're shaping the world on a daily basis? Sometimes you feel that way, sometimes not. Sometimes you think, I'm just dealing with my own little corner of the universe right here. Just my podcast. I have a podcast. It's called Bad Guru Nightly. And it's a motivational comedy show. And I wouldn't tell anybody this is a world-changing podcast, but it is. Just like yours. Just like your business. Just like what you're doing. It's world-changing. Now think about this. Think about leaving here and going home, going to bed, waking up in the morning and focusing on your vision and your idea. But instead of just focusing on the vision of your idea and finding the motivation to get out of bed in the morning and to do that work, what if that motivation didn't only come from getting the job done, but by making the world a better place? What if your purpose, what if the mission for whatever project you're engaged in wasn't just to make this project successful, but to shape the world around you? Doesn't that feel like a bigger story? Doesn't that feel like a bigger narrative? And doesn't that bigger story give you a little bit more motivation, a little bit more inspiration in what you before. If you thought that you were part of something bigger than just yourself, would you feel more motivated, more inspired, more engaged in the world? That's what I want to give you here today. I want to give you a shared purpose. So the first principle is who. The who is always you. It's always you from the inside out. And what we're going to, what I want you to do slowly over time is to expand the definition of self to include other people. That doesn't mean you have to know everybody by name. It doesn't mean that you have to interact with every single person that you meet. It doesn't mean that you have to give change to every homeless person on the street. That's not what it means. But it means that whenever you're looking at whatever you're trying to create, whatever you're trying to do, you're not just going to think about it in isolation. You're going to think about it in context with the world. And there is something that you're going to want to do that you're going to choose not to do because it doesn't satisfy that larger desire. And there are some things that you might not immediately feel like doing, but by focusing in this way, you will want to do, and it will make what you do more impactful. It will make what you do resonate with more and more people. I remember I was on a stage uh, uh, doing some comedy, 
And comedians, they're always trying things out, you know? They're always, they, they find the line, they cross that line, and then they take a step back. And I remember being on stage and telling some jokes, and uh, it wasn't going well this day. This is what we call bombing. It wasn't going well this day, you know? I was feeling very stressed out. I'm on the stage, and I, I'm, about, I'm about to say a joke, and I can tell, I can feel, in, I can feel within myself that I feel kind of like embarrassed to say this joke. It's a joke I've said many times before. I won't tell you here today. Don't. No, I won't tell you here today. It's a very not a joke. But I felt kind of, I felt kind of. Talk to me later, I'll tell the joke. I felt, I felt kind of strange about it. And I realized that I've said this joke many times before and it's gone and laughed. But now that I'm observing it in this different way, I'm recognizing that even though this joke gets a laugh, I'm kind of ashamed of it. I feel kind of a little bit wrong. And because I'm paying attention to what's happening within myself, and because I'm recognizing, hey, how is this joke going to influence the audience and the people around, I decide I'm not going to say this joke even though I want to. I have been tempted to pay for Instagram followers. <laughs> I know, I'm the only one. I'm the only one. I'm the only one. All right? Because it seems like it could work. Right? I follow some people and someone tells me, oh, that person has a million followers, or that half of them are bots. I'm like, how do I get those bots? <laughs> I want those bots too. But when we all act in that way, so the bottom line, just get the followers by any means possible, get the viewers by any means possible, make the sale by any means possible, it might help us right now. But what does it do for tomorrow? What does it do for the next people who are following in your footsteps? The first principle is why. The sec second principle, I forget, forget, the first principle is who. The second principle is why. Why is your motivation. <sighs> Folks, do you have a why? Do you have a reason for what you're doing? Yeah, changing lives. Changing lives, absolutely, for the better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can change your lives real quick. It's up to you. I mean, like you. You love me this time. Excellent. Yeah. I love that. I love yeah. that. Yes, perfect. Does anybody else have a why? Why you're doing what you're doing? I really like that your hands are not going up. It means that either you're not so sure about the why, which is a great place for you. It's a great, it's great that you're here today because I'm going to give you this why. It might be that you haven't thought about it, but your why should be on the tip of your tongue. I have a point to the uh, beginning of the uh, talk. Uh, if, you, if you're thinking about ethics, those are doubts when you are not connected with your true self and your soul. And once you're aligned with your life purpose, things just become like, oh, this is, I need to do this. And then there's like no thing small or big that is kind of like stopping you. It's kind of like clutching your throat in the longer path. Absolutely. Do you know that someone with a purpose, someone with a why, someone with a clear motivation, there's very little that can hold them back. There's very little that can hold them back. I want to ask you more about your whys, but I feel like I don't want to be picking on anybody here or anything like that. I think it's very important to know the reason why you're waking up in the morning. There are times in my life where I did not feel like getting out of bed in the morning. There are times in my life where I didn't even want a tomorrow. And it's because I didn't have a purpose. I didn't have a why. I didn't know what that was. It used to be Jesus. It used to be Jesus. Oh man, when I went to church, oh my God, it was so fantastic. I just be in church, and they, we all shared a purpose. We all shared why we knew exactly where I was going. And then when things got kind of sour in church, and I left the, left church, and I left the community, and I was out in the world, I looked at everybody else, and I was like, Wow, everybody's just sort of running around, like not getting what's going on. And I, I actually preferred the lie over the truth of <laughs> just being wandering, right? But in this world, you have to make your own why. You have to figure it out for yourself. My why is to make the world a better place. How do I want to be a better place? I believe that by empowering individuals to be the best versions of themselves, they will go after what is of value to them. And when they go after what is of value to them individually, then we have hundreds, millions, hundreds of millions of people individually shaping the world with the power of their attention, with the power of their vision, with what they care about. I believe people like you are responsible the future that is to come. Now, I don't know what the future is going to be like. Do you? 
I mean, I watched the Jetsons. I don't think we're close to that. I don't think we're close to Elon Musk is making electric cars and not, they're not flying. There's no robots that I can talk to. I don't know what the future's going to be like. Maybe the Flintstones? Maybe the Flintstones? Look, if uh, the world continues going the way it goes, maybe we'll go back to that, that's for sure. But, uh, you know, it'd be fun to sort of ride the cars with pedals and stuff. But uh, I, don't, I don't know what the future's going to be like, the details of it. I don't know what technology is going to be there. I don't know what faith is going to be around. I don't know what's going to be there. But what I do know, or what I do want, what I do hope, is that we move from competition to collaboration. Competition works really well. It worked really well at the beginning of humankind and up, up until the recent, recent past, right? Now we're entering an age of technology where we're able to collaborate more than ever before. Are you with me with this competition collaboration thing? For the most part, yes. Um, and I even make a case for uh, collectivism and collaboration very, very quickly, which is in music, artists can do covers of each other to help fans um, to cross-pollinate. Uh, but I wouldn't expect competition to be taken out of sports. You still want teams to go up against each other. They're not collaborating to have a game. So a reduction, I can see that for sure. Absolutely. I, I believe that there will be always be competition, but I think competition will exist within collaboration. You might, I, I can argue, just like you, that the two football teams are not collaborating, okay? <laughs> but they also are collaborating, right? There are sort of rules and a spirit to the game that they are, that they agree to, right? Either explicitly or implicitly. They're agreeing to this type of collaboration. It's sometimes it's easy to see the world as a zero-sum game, that there's this pie, we're dividing the pie, and you get your piece, and if you get some, then I can get some. But technology has created a, a, an age of prosperity and abundance. You see, what's, what's going on is that the internet is connecting different parts, and we're creating more than what existed before. We're creating more than what existed before. And so that means the pie is getting bigger, and that means you can get your slice. And that means if you can get out of the sense of, of, of fighting your neighbor, look, folks, I, oh my goodness, I, I feel jealous all the time of people, right? And I really love it. I love it. I have a twin brother, you just grow up that way. I'm better than you, you're better than me. This week he's better than me. He had a great talk this morning. Um, it was really fantastic. But you're just like, oh man, I just wish you could, I could just step on him on the way up, you know, just, oh, just get up there, you know? And it feels so good to have that status to climb the, climb the mountain. I just found something that I just want to say. Somebody said that they didn't have competitors, just alternative options. And I really like that. It seems to be just another instance of teams to it. Absolutely. I think that what we see as, com as competition isn't actually competition, certainly more now than ever before. The competition breeds collaboration. It we, can. We wouldn't have a lot of things. We would have an iPhone if, if Steve Jobs didn't feel the need to compete with Microsoft at the time, right? Or IBM at the time. Absolutely. I, I am not negating competition. Competition has served its role and will continue to serve its role. All I want is an emphasis now, a little bit more on collaboration, because technology is allowing us to do it more than ever before. It used to be that when a show was on TV, it was competing with the other show on TV because they were on at the same time. We had to choose one over the other. I see your hand there. We had to choose one over the other. But now, with the internet, this YouTuber can have a million subscribers, and this YouTuber can have a million subscribers, and they can be the same subscribers because we have asynchronous communication. I don't have to watch it at a locked in time. I don't have to watch it on the TV. I can, so now, uh, musicians, the reason why they're collaborating more so than ever before, before they weren't allowed to collaborate. Who wants to give advertising to your competitor? But now it doesn't work that way. Now collaboration is the best. Many of the artists that you love, many of the TV shows that you love are collaborating because they're recognizing we don't have to compete for the audience anymore. We're not dividing the pie. And the pie is only growing. There's going to be a rising billion that are coming onto the internet uh, uh, as we go forward, and the audience is only going to get bigger. And every individual here doesn't, you don't even need 10 million people in order to follow you. All you need is a thousand people who are interested in what you have to offer on a monthly basis, and you can make a living from it. So we can all find a thousand people, and there is a ton of crossover, but if we still get stuck in that mentality of competitiveness, it's you or me, that we're missing the opportunity that's right there in front of our face. That's emphasized collaboration. I certainly don't want to get rid of competition, right? I love the feeling of stomping on my brother. I'm not going to get rid of that. It's not going away. But collaboration, that the, it changes the way we think about the world, and it changes the way we use the resources that are available to us. They're on the field, they're going after the end, and then afterwards, they're signing on the grass for kids, they're 
Exactly. And when I talk about switching my brother, that's exactly what I mean. Yes, so, <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. He's right here. <laughs> yeah. 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 He doesn't deserve attention, though. Yeah, just going off the first point, and the one I was going to make is uh, rugby is one of those games where you play against someone that all hour you hate him, and right after that game, you pay you to you buy that guy a beer with your opposite number. That's the element of that sport. But what I was going to say to you is, uh, based on what you were saying, collaboration. I just heard an interesting thing, whether you're a fan or not of his, that's not the point. But Joe Rogan, sure. in his podcast, politicians are fighting to be on his show for that position versus the usual way of doing it because of the fact that there's this sort of unofficial collaboration. And I don't know if he wants any of it, but what I'm, what I'm saying is the whole stage has changed. Yeah, because of it. And that's probably going to be you know, discussed in, in one of these sessions. Yeah. yeah, and I just wanted to add to that because I worked in television for 23 years and I worked 18 of those in programming and development. And I can tell you right now that that it's very interesting that you said that because the reason why they're also fighting to get on Joe Rogan's show and why not? Because when you work in the television setting, because I worked for Big Chum Group. You know, starting my days of much music and then going to Bravo. We, you're not allowed to say and do a lot of things. There's a lot, so collaboration can be limited, and um, competition can be ugly in, in in traditional TV. So it's very interesting, and that's why the internet and what you were just saying about the piece of the pie. And you know, one of the reasons why I got let go after 23 years was because the internet took over so much that nobody's watching TV. And they say by 2024, in the US, 50% of households will have gotten rid of their cable. And I think even more than that. And if you, because I saw the Nielsen ratings every day because I worked in programming. You know, I know now, even today, for a fact, like CBC Nightly News at 6 o'clock, the Toronto edition, they only get about 12,000 viewers. Mm -hmm. Because now everybody, right, is going to the internet. And you know what? The big broadcasters are starting to get all their streaming services and everything. Because it's like what you were saying. Before, you could only watch either whatever on NBC or whatever on CBC, because you didn't even have that PBR. Maybe in the U.S. earlier, but Canada were so behind and everything. That's right. Uh, and that's why now everybody wants to jump on the streaming services because you can watch this and you can watch that because households, it's not only about, I know my household, we're four people and we each have our own laptop. Plus we have the one computer that we always use for the screen. That's right. And it's going to get, it's, it's going to get, gonna get yeah. It's going to get much crazier, and yes. and that's why I said we don't. I can't predict the future. I don't know what yeah. it's going to be like exactly. I have my uh, my assumptions, but what I do know is the the quality of the experience, that the nature of our behavior is going to be, have to be put under a microscope. Yeah. In fact, your behavior is going to be put under a microscope by the viewers that you have because they're going to be able to look you up. They're going to be able to look at your history more so than ever before. I know I'm running out of time, so I want to make sure I get to this. Thank you for your contributions here. All right, so the why is important, the, 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 the who is important, that's the self. The why is the motivation. And the last one is the how. Now, most of the time, people talk to me, they go, Peter, how do I improve my life? How do I create this? How do I do that? How, how, how? And I always save the how for the end because really it's, it's not as important as the why. But the how is important too. The how, the answer to how, the answer to how, if you want to know the secret to how is, if you want people to listen to you to say the secret to how is, <laughs> Habit. Habit. Habit is what creates. Habit is the only thing that creates. Action over time creates change. Action over time creates change. Water dripping on stone can create a cavern over time. Habit is what creates change. Habit is how you create. So the habit I want you to focus on here is a habit of attention. This world is an attention economy. 
And whoever gets attention is the one that gets successful. But I'm not talking about the attention economy right now. What I'm talking about is paying attention to the thoughts in your mind and the feeling in your heart. Because your emotions, what's happening within you, your feelings, are letting you know more clearly than anything how you feel about what's going on. You ever in a situation just feel a little bit off? Just something just seems... Somebody tells you, oh, you should do this, you should put money in that, you should market this way, you, should, you feel like that, but that doesn't feel like me. Oh, but Gary V is doing it. All right, well, I want to be willing to say it's good for Gary V, but not for me, right? And when you pay attention to the thoughts in your mind and the, and the, the feelings that are in your heart, to what's going on within you, it's, it's, it's far more discerning. And if you care enough about what's going on, you're going to find that feeling and you're not going to ignore it for the bottom line. You're not going to ignore it. You're going to be willing to do something about it. The habit to create what you want to create is the habit of thought and a habit of emotion. You're paying attention to what's happening with that, within you. Look, folks, there are probably people in other rooms, people who are telling you practical information in order to get your business off the ground. Practical information in order to get things done. And that's absolutely wonderful. My brother gave some practical information this morning. It was really fantastic. But I believe that what I'm offering is also practical. I feel it's more practical than the actual concrete actions that you have to take because the world operates from the inside out. And we forget that. As an entrepreneur, you're so busy engaged in dealing with the facts and the numbers and the details of your world, so engaged in other people that you forget what the heck is happening within me. How clear-minded am I? If you want to achieve success online, if you want to achieve success in what you need to do, you need to, one, be more personable. Your personality must shine through because your personality is what's unique about you. That's what differentiates you from other people. This person has a podcast where they interview people. This person has a podcast where they interview people. Which one are you going to listen to? The one that accentuates their personality the most. The one that seems different, that stands out. Well, folks, if you don't know who you are, if you don't know what makes you you, you won't know what to put into your craft. You won't know how to shape it. If you're not willing and bold enough to color outside of the lines, then you're going to follow the patterns of the people who came before you without asking yourself, yes, these steps brought me here and that's good, but could these steps be better? Am I willing to step in the snow? Am I willing to do the hard thing and call outside of the lines? And when you do that, that's what authenticity is. Being authentic, being an authentic person, shows itself when people are willing to make mistakes, when people are willing to mess up. When I see people online mess up, I feel closer to them. When they seem perfect, it feels sterile. Right? When people mess up. I love watching live things. I love watching live shows. I love watching live events. Oh, sorry, we're having technical problems. I want to know how you deal with live technical problems. <laughs> because it's fun. Because it's good. It makes you feel like it's harder to fool someone. I feel like I'm being less fooled when I'm seeing the mistakes that you're making as opposed to you're all perfect, all perfect and I'm wondering, hey, what's going on behind the scenes? Right? Knowing who you are, caring, paying attention to what's happening within you, I believe, is the reason the world is the way it is. I think people have forgotten. People have forgotten. Forgive me, I'm running out of time here. But oh, no, yeah. Um, just quickly, it's funny you said mistake, because, you know, we have a podcast, we're a couple, and so when we used to do our live shows, and one day our kids came in, and we're like, get a free, leave, leave. <laughs> Send me that episode. I want to see that episode. I love that. <laughs> Absolutely. But how many of us, you don't have to raise your hand, how many of us, just think to yourself, how many of us have been afraid to make mistakes? Have not made that bold choice, have not been willing to move forward, right? How many of us, good for you, I'm just running out of chance here, if I feel on here. I'm so happy you guys are raising your hand, you're engaged, I love this, this is fantastic. They should give me two hours, right? <laughs> how many of us are, have a, a fear to move forward, a fear to risk something, a fear to try something new? Look, folks, entrepreneurs, they face their fears. That's what they do. The true entrepreneur sees a problem and goes forward and tries to solve that problem to the best of their ability, and their fear is only an indicator to, the, to, to them that lets them know I'm doing something new. And so they seek it out. 
They look for reasons to extend themselves. They try new things. If you want to be in the vanguard in this world, and there's, there are going to be so many more entrepreneurs coming after you, you have no idea. This world, with AI, with the way technology is going, people are sitting in jobs they think are safe. Not safe at all. Uh, a robot can do my job. <laughs> I've heard a robot play the violin. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> okay, I can play the violin. The robot's going to do what's going to happen in the future. People are going to gravitate to people who are authentic, true human beings. And what's human is the good and the bad. What's human is all the details that surround you. What's human is what's uniquely you. Now you might not know what's uniquely you, but that's the experimentation. Pay attention to your life. Look at what's going on. You might think, oh Peter, I'm doing, I'm doing the show and I also care about knitting. But knitting doesn't have anything to do with what I'm doing. Knit on your show and I want to see you do that. Let's see you be different. This is uh, Tom Hartman interviews uh, Elon Musk at knitting. Like, I want to see that. Okay? Be, that's how you become different. That's how you become more authentic. And that's how you express what you care about. Every single moment of every single day, you are engaged in an economy. You are shaping the world around you by the choices that you make. Most of the choices you make are made pre-programmed choices. Right? Uh, you saw an advertisement, uh, the same circles do the same things. But folks, an entrepreneur is somebody who steps out. An entrepreneur is someone who colors outside of the box. An entrepreneur is someone who seeks out fear, seeks out discomfort. And in that, in so doing, you will find the magic that makes you you. All right. Believe it or not, I got to um, just two of my points here today. <laughs> um, all right. How do you be a heroic entrepreneur? Entrepreneurs, there were a lot of them. But I don't know that there were many heroic entrepreneurs. Do you ever think about those men and women back in the days who took up their swords and shield and went into battle and war and fought and died? You ever thought of these people who made the world that you're living in today, who made a, us, who, who enforced boundaries and created safety? You ever wonder about those people out there who went and put, I think to myself, I don't know if I can do that. I don't know if I can do that. Why did those people do that? Why did those warriors, those soldiers, those husbands and wives, why did they go and fight? Why? Who were they fighting for? They were fighting for their loved ones, their family, their culture, their freedom. Today, we don't fight with swords and shields. But it's not only with swords and shields. We fight. Entrepreneurs are the champions and the vanguard. Entrepreneurs are the ones in front. Everybody has a job. Entrepreneurs have a mission. And they move forward and they fight and they try to find ways forward. And what they're doing, whether they're aware of it or not, they're helping the people behind them. They're helping the society that they come from. I know for a fact that every single one of you want a better world. You all have your own minds about it, but the reason you want to engage and take charge of yourself is because you want to live in a world where people take charge of themselves. I bet you, you don't only want you to be an entrepreneur. You look at everybody else and you go, hey, you should be an entrepreneur. You should start a podcast. You should start a blog. Don't you feel this way? Don't you feel like, I know what it feels like to do your own thing and it's hard and it's miserable and there's sacrifice and there's pain. But man, this is the way we should live. People, this is the way we should live. This way, this way. Right? And Christopher Columbus could only convince a few people to go on this boat. <laughs> Most people were like, what? You want to sell up to get to the earth? He's like, Let's go see the engineer. Let's go see. Maybe they're okay. Let's go see. He didn't have Facebook. He didn't have any Facebook, right? He didn't have any Facebook. But it matters what you do. And I see entrepreneurs as that vanguard. And they're out there. But sometimes I feel like people forget why they're fighting, why they're doing what they're doing. It's not just so you make a buck. It's not just so you can make a living. It's so that you can make a life, not only for you, but for everyone else. It matters. And so you're going to be faced with many choices. Competition versus collaboration. You're going to be faced with uh, uh, doing shady behaviors or going the, the wholesome route. You're going to be faced with giving up or persevering. But if you give up, if you stop, that's one less person who's fighting for the future. If you stop, if you find some reason to, to put down your arms and say, this is too hard. It's easier for me to get a job. If you do that, you are shaping the future. That isn't the future that we want. 
It matters what we do. Now, why am I telling you this? Yes, I love the sound of my voice. <laughs> but I feel like the missing ingredient, or the ingredient I want to emphasize the most in this world, is purpose. Purpose, your why, the reason to wake up in the morning, the reason to do what you do. And what I know for a fact is that when you care about your why, when you have purpose, every single thing you do or have to do gets easier. I'm not living, we don't live in a world with magic. We don't live in a world with effortless creation. It takes effort to do things. And everyone wants to find an easier way to do what they want to do, an easier way to do what they need to do. I get that. But when you have a purpose in life, the same thing that requires effort feels effortless. It feels more effortless to send those emails. It feels more effortless to do those videos because you're not just doing it for you. You are not designed as individual creatures. You are, by nature, social creatures. It takes two people to make one person. It is your nature to be social. It's your nature to connect to community and to culture. And if you are just doing your thing and you're locked in, in isolation, you are missing everything that is required to nourish you, to nourish you within you, your mind and your heart, the fuel that you need to get out there and to do the hard thing. And that's why I'm here today. I'm spreading a message of shared purpose. We share a purpose. We all want the world to be a better place. So when someone presents you a way forward, ask yourself, what do I think about this? And how do I feel about this? And is there a way that I would prefer to go? And if there's a way that you prefer to go, be willing to step out and follow those new steps. This is an idea that I'm sharing. And I believe that ideas are contagious. I believe that you can be affected by an idea even against your will. I, for an, I'll give you an example. I'll, you, I'll end with this. Is that okay? I'll end with this. I don't like staircases. I know it's weird. But staircases, I just don't like them. All right? I come out of the subway, I go up the stairs, and there's a bunch of people in front of me. Just a bunch of people, a bunch of butts. Just butts. Just buttholes pointed in my direction. And I think to myself, every time I'm on the staircase, I know, statistically, there's got to be at least one or two people who are farting in my direction right now. It's a fact. I know it. I think about that every single time I'm on the staircase. And now you will too. You've got to be careful what you pay attention to. Thank you very much. For